Greetings and welcome to today's talk. I'm Justin Jacobs, professor of history at American University, and today we have a fascinating topic, one sure to catch the interest of anyone who has ever been interested in dinosaurs. That's pretty much the entire human race. Our topic is the politics of dinosaur fossils, or what I like to term in sort of a, a shorthand phrase, dino nationalism. All right, and you'll understand what we mean by this phrase by the end of today's talk. Uh, we don't have any major profound points to make beyond one today. This is going to be a very fairly simple, straightforward, and hopefully short talk um, in which we're just going to understand one simple fact, how dinosaurs and pretty much anything from the prehistorical age, long before the formation or imagined formation of modern nations and modern countries and identities and whatnot, long before these things ever existed, long before there was even writing had been invented or human civilization or humans themselves, homo sapiens had even evolved. Uh, we will see how anything from the ancient paleontological prehistorical past um, will still get interpreted in the 19th and 20th century as somehow being an emblem, a symbol, the embodiment of these modern constructed, invented, imagined communities, these invented nations and identities that we are encouraged to subscribe to. Uh, we're gonna see how the uh, uh, fossil finds of Tyrannosaurus rex, Brontosaurus, uh, uh, Triceratops in Wyoming in the 1880s and 1890s will be interpreted as somehow uniquely American, bones embodying an American identity. Um, and these sort of things that at the time it seemed like it made sense, but us looking 100, 120 years after the fact, we look back and we think, isn't this utterly absurd to think that anyone ever believed that you could have dinosaur fossils 60 million years old, 100 million years old, um, and they're somehow seen as representative of modern day invented national identities uh, 100 million years later, somehow that Tyrannosaurus Rex embodies uh, the American identity in the 20th century, it's utterly absurd. Uh, but so many things in history, so many ideologies uh, do seem utterly absurd when you have the distance of hindsight and you can apply a critical eye to them. Um, so let's get started and understand how dinosaur fossils, uh, something that you would never imagine uh, could be politicized, actually is often politicized even to this very day. So hopefully the next time you see a spectacular dinosaur exhibit somewhere, uh, you, will, you, you will be able to <clears throat> bring a more critical lens to some of the unspoken, subtle political and cultural agendas uh, that these things represent. All right. Um, all right. So let's begin sort of with the history of the discovery of dinosaur fossils and a little bit of intro here in context to understand what we're talking about. If you don't know already, the first dinosaur fossils were actually uh, found in England in the 1820s and the 1830s. So early, early half of the 19th century. However, these early bones were mostly teeth and a few random bones, not entire collections. They weren't very impressive, and they didn't yet stand out from other cool prehistoric fossils that were also being discovered at that time, but were from a different class of animals uh, than the dinosaurs. Things like marine reptiles, such as the ichthyosaurus, the plesiosaur, uh, these were very impressive prehistorical uh, 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 beasts, uh, but not quite dinosaurs. Um, and so the early discoveries of dinosaur teeth and some random bones wasn't yet competing uh, with other uh, uh, things that had been found at the time. It really wasn't until 1841 that dinosaur bones were deemed sufficiently unique to earn the new biological category of dinosauria, which was described as, quote, a new suborder of saurian reptiles. Still, however, the bones did not yet allow for anything close to an educated speculation of what these animals actually looked like. Here we have our first example of an attempt to create 3D reconstructions. 3D reconstructions at the Crystal Palace, uh, which was one of these international exhibitions similar to Giovanni Belzoni's panorama of the tomb of Seti I from Luxor, from the Valley of the Kings that opened up in London in 1821, uh, similar to uh, world fairs that you've seen that 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 uh, uh, were very popular in the second half of the 19th century and first half of the 20th century. 
Crystal Palace in London in 1854 uh, was one of the most famous. It consisted of two parts. You have sort of the actual Crystal Palace itself, which I believe later burned down. That's the structure in, in the background. Many of the exhibits would be inside there. There was a very famous Egypt exhibit. There were always Egypt exhibits. Remember, Egyptomania is always huge. And then outside as well, there were some exhibits. And this is where the earliest reconstructions of dinosaur uh, uh, fossils and what we, you know, people were thinking might they act, actually have looked like, they took place. Uh, they were placed outside of the Crystal Palace for people to walk around here. You can see actually the Victorian gentlemen and gentlewomen uh, uh, meandering around and looking at these magnificent beasts. Now, these reconstructions were criticized at the time by many naturalists who still said, we don't yet have enough knowledge of these uh, animals to be able to accurately reconstruct them in any way, shape, or form. However, the desire to uh, uh, interact, engage with the general public, to get their attention, uh, we, 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 we have seen this impulse many times, um, and we can see it here again, dinosaurs guaranteed to attract a large audience, right? So even if you don't have all the knowledge you need, they were, they were already jumping the gun and saying, we got to try to at least speculate and see what these things might have actually looked like. Some of these dinosaurs, actually, you can look them up online are still actually, uh, uh, they have preserved them. Uh, the, re the reconstructions from 1854 are still uh, somewhere in London today. You can go visit them um, and see what people thought dinosaurs looked like 170 years ago. Now, it wasn't until the 1870s. In the 1870s, you start to get the, the new discovery of dinosaurs such as Stegosaurus, Allosaurus, Brontosaurus, and Triceratops in the American West, uh, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah. Um, and with the discovery of these massive dinosaurs and more complete fossil skeletons, paleontologists finally were beginning to get a good sense of just how large and impressive dinosaurs were. These 1870s discoveries and enthusiasm enabled the construction of the first somewhat plausible dinosaur displays for public viewing. And once the immense size and outlandish appearance of these dinosaurs was known, uh, reconstructions of dinosaurs were guaranteed to become public spectacles and attract enormous crowds. Now remember, this is catnip for wealthy philanthropists who are looking to associate themselves with benevolent, civic-minded agendas, both at home and abroad. New, massive dinosaur fossils fit the bill. They are large, they are impressive, and as we'll see, they would be interpreted as somehow distinctly American, <laughs> okay? As opposed to British or French or German or Chinese, somehow these embody the spirit of our modern nation. And because they're gonna bring in the crowds, this is how you justify uh, the museums that the wealthy uh, uh, philanthropists want to be able to put their money into. They want to launder their money in a way that looks like it's a benevolent, public-minded, civic mission. Uh, and anything that brings in the crowd, even if the crowd is only coming to be uh, uh, engaged things like Egyptomania, uh, at least the philanthropists and the curators in the museum can at least act like they can say on paper we were educating them, even if very few might actually go away having truly been educated. So we're going to talk about two major exhibits and curatorial processes of dinosaur fossils that were found in the American West in the latter half of the of, of in the latter half of the 19th century and how they ended up going on display in various museums throughout the world and the political context that was read into these things when they were reconstructed and put on display. Now we're going to find that it's very similar to uh, historical art and artifacts that actually are represented of uh, uh, historical human civilizations. So let's begin our story in 1891. This is when Henry, uh, Henry Fairfield Osborne, uh, the nephew of J.P. Morgan, uh, takes up dual positions at Columbia University and the American Museum of Natural History in New York, where he is the head of the paleontology department. Henry Osborne is going to be a very major figure in global paleontological research. Uh, 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 during the first half of the 20th century. We see him also in the expeditions of Roy Chapman Andrews in uh, North 
North Central China, Inner Mongolia, Outer Mongolia in the 19 teens and the 1920s. Uh, Henry Osborne as director of the uh, head of the paleontology uh, museum and, and, and later major figure at the American uh, Museum of Natural History. Uh, he actually is the, the chief sponsor of Roy Chapman Andrews expeditions to Northwestern China. So when he takes up this position in the 1890s, he immediately starts to acquire new dinosaur fossils from Como Bluff in Wyoming. And he begins to pioneer the practice of combining bones from different animals to mount a single complete dinosaur fossil reconstruction. And he decides to place increasing emphasis on a showcase reconstructed dinosaur skeleton as the focal point of the American Museum of Natural History's engagement with the general public. This was a controversial idea that was ridiculed by many scientists. It seems very natural for us today. Anytime, anytime you go to a natural history museum, you expect their showcase exhibit, you know, sort of this is what all, this is what I paid for if you had to pay for it. And it wasn't a free natural history museum. If you had to pay for it, this is where your money went, right? You're gonna go see that spectacular reconstruction of a, of a brontosaurus, of a Tyrannosaurus rex. I know when I go to the natural history museum in downtown DC on the National Mall, uh, I used to go there all the time with my kids. Uh, I always looked forward to saying, okay, we're gonna go into the dinosaurs now. Oh, let's be wowed by the Tyrannosaurus rex. That's your showcase skeleton, all right? Many scientists, didn't like this idea of having these showcase in your face, uh, attract the masses, reconstructed dinosaur skeletons. They say it brings in the vulgar masses and it inhibits scholarly research. Remember Joseph Henry, the director of the Smithsonian Institution who also sort of had a similar criticism. Uh, scholars aren't always the most sociable of people. Uh, many of us are sort of mi uh, misanthropes, uh, which means we don't get along with big masses. You know, we wanna do our research, sit in our little room and whatnot and publish our reports. And we have a hard time interacting with other people sometimes. So it brings in the vulgar masses. It inhibits scholarly research and encourages us to make unconscionable mistakes and dubious judgment calls in the reconstruction of dinosaur bones. And this is gonna open us up to ridicule from other scholars. Nevertheless, the money is gonna go where you're able to procure political and social capital from it. And if you can bring in the numbers, huge numbers of people, for whatever purpose, even if they're just coming to gawk and stare at a magnificent beast and they learn nothing about it whatsoever, the philanthropist behind it can say, on paper, I educated 10,000 people who came into the museum today. You can, you, you can still make that claim. So, regardless of the criticism, uh, the first uh, 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 dinosaur cast are going to be increasingly displayed in the second half of the 19th century. Um, now, some of the big ones we're going to be talking about are right at the turn of the 19th century, uh, turn of the 20th century. Um, but uh, we actually can go back to 1868 to see our first full dinosaur cast exhibited at the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences in 1868. And the lessons from this were very important. They would be heeded by many philanthropists and museum curators ever since. Um, they uh, brought in a ton of people who were willing to come in and see this cast, the reconstruction of a hadrosaur dinosaur in 1868. And this really annoyed the scientists who were employed in the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences. They actually campaigned when they had all these masses coming into their museum. Uh, they, they campaigned for an, an admission charge. Said, don't let it be free. Uh, if we have an admission charge, that'll lessen the crowds and they'll stay away from our showrooms. And they said, what is in our showroom now? What is this cast of a hadrosaur? I said, quote, these showrooms chiefly exhibit animal monsters and effigies of strange things. In a word, whatever a wonder monger can collect to allure the curious and idle to amusement at small individual cost to them, but lucrative to the showman. And they also said combining multiple skeletons into a single skeleton, which was common practice, you have to do that actually, to have a full reconstruction. Most people don't realize when you go to a museum and you see that wonderful reconstruction of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, it's never all bones from one Tyrannosaurus Rex. That is unheard of. It is always a melange of bones and fossils from multiple different animals. Sometimes it might not even be the exact same species. It'll be a closely related species. Sometimes you still won't have, even with putting multiple closely related species together and multiple Tyrannosaurus rex, maybe the same species, you'll still have missing parts. You know, things don't survive from 100 million years ago in all that great condition. A lot of stuff is gone usually. It's tough to get a complete skeleton. 
And when you still have missing parts, what do they do? They'll create a plaster cast of what they think the missing bone looks like and put that in there. And most people have no idea. <laughs> Unless you yourself are a paleontologist, you'll understand how this works. Most people go in and they think, oh, this is, this is a complete skeleton of one dinosaur. But the scientists who were involved in this in the beginning, they said this is downright blasphemous. So the, the dinosaurs were destroyed and dismembered long ago by their natural enemies, and now their friends have done them further injustice in putting together their scattered remains. They criticized every aspect of the practice, hiding the steel supports, filling missing bones with plaster reconstructions, not always marking bones from different skeletons in red marker to indicate, just so you know, these are from different animals. Um, and sometimes they said, we don't like how you include painted backdrops. You never just go into a natural history museum and you see the skeleton against a white wall, right? They usually will put it behind, you know, in front of a mural that some artist has painted back there to sort of put it in its original context uh, uh, once more. And they're saying, are we no better than the circus? Are we no better than, than wild bills or what are Buffalo bills, wild West show? amusement parks and other charlatans who just want to make money and deceive the ignorant, vulgar, superstitious masses. But the museums persisted. Osborne persisted. And the result was what we might call the first celebrity dinosaur reconstruction exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History in 1905. This is, so this is going to be the first of our two case studies of how dinosaurs uh, 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 sort of engage the public, uh, uh, cultivate social and political capital for the people who sponsor their reconstruction, this is a very expensive process, and have political meaning projected, infused into them. Now, the first one, uh, th this uh, uh, first dinosaur to really be sort of, you know, capture the public's attention, uh, to be massive size and fully reconstructed was this brontosaurus, 70 feet long. You're looking at it right here, uh, the brontosaurus, 70 feet long, 15 feet high. It was described in the New York press. Here is the um, uh, 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 co contemporary newspaper report about it. Um, it was described in the New York press as having, quote, a stomach cavity the size of a Harlem flat. Here you can see sort of the hyperbole um, and exaggeration and the sensationalism uh, that was uh, purposely pumped up and peddled and promoted to the general masses to get them in here. A mammoth native of Wyoming of some odd million years ago. They don't, at this time, they don't have a good idea of how old they are. 67 feet long with a stomach cavity as big as the kitchen of a Harlem flat. All right, truly amazing here you have down here at the skull alone, uh, the relative size of uh, the uh, skull right next to a human body. Um, they have up here brontosaurus foot and the human foot, comparing these things uh, once again to play up the sensational aspect. Uh, you can see not, not necessarily this is designed to sort of bring in the masses and methodically educate them. It's designed to wow the masses and to check off a little box where they're going to go home and say, I saw this magnificent beast at the American Museum of Natural History today. And indeed, attendance skyrocketed to 500,000 people that year including J.P. Morgan and Teddy Roosevelt's sister who came to the grand opening. I told you this was a, a celebrity dinosaur exhibit. Now, Henry Osborne, who's sort of the head paleontologist who's directing this whole, the, the, this whole exhibit, uh, he had his supporters, the anthropologist Franz Boas. We've seen him before in criticizing archaeologists who used their, their uh, job as a cover for explicit espionage during World War I and suffered as a result of that. This is long before then, uh, some 15 years before he joins that uh, heated debate. Franz Boas wrote an article in Science Magazine arguing that such spectacles helped museums compete with the baneful influence of the saloon and the racetrack. Because, quote, the people who seek rest and recreation resent an attempt at systematic instruction while they are looking for some emotional excitement, dinosaur reconstruction satisfy their base need for leisure while subtly educating them, subtly educating them. Education still goes on. I said, quote, when the installation of a new immense mounted skeleton of some extinct animal is announced, people will flock to the crowd, will flock in crowds to see the specimen. So they had his supporters who said, you know what? Yes, we understand. I'm, I'm a scientist. I understand there's a lot of scientific sins that are being committed here in doing a reconstruction of a dinosaur skeleton. However, 
It says the ends justifies the means. And yes, I have faith that some sort of education, trickle-down education, <laughs> trickle-down economics, trickle-down education is happening here. Therefore, don't worry. Yes, a lot of vulgar masses are coming in to gawk and gaze and take their early 20th century equivalent of selfies. Um, but nevertheless, some education is going on. And that makes it worthwhile. Because if they don't come to this, you know where they're going. They're going to the racetrack. They're going to gamble. They're going to go to bars. They're going to drink and get in fights and do what low-class, vulgar, uneducated people do. So this is still a net good. Right? Phew! The philanthropists are saying, uh, all right, good, I can still launder my money in either a museum of art and antiquities or a museum of prehistory. Uh, I'm still going to be able to get my pound of social and political capital out of it. All right, so that's sort of the political value of dinosaurs uh, for a domestic audience. Now let's see the value that they take on when transported outside of a domestic context and put into an international context. Dinosaurs crossing borders. 100 million years after he died. And for here, we're going to look at what is known as the Carnegie Diplot Diplodocus. The Carnegie Diplodocus. I almost always stutter when I try to pronounce that. Uh, very similar to the Brontosaurus. Can I just say Brontosaurus? I can pronounce that much better. All right, I'll, I'll try to be accurate. I don't want to be like a charlatan who is deceiving you by, 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 by uh, presenting something that isn't quite necessarily accurate. All right. The Carnegie Diplodocus. I can do this. All right. In May 1905, the British Museum of Natural History unveiled a plaster replica of a brontosaurus skeleton on display originally in the Carnegie Museum of Pittsburgh. All right, here we are. Here we have, uh, well, here's one of the uh, 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 Carnegie Diplodocus cast, not the one specifically in London. Um, but the one in London was one of 12 reconstructions of the original that Carnegie donated to institutions around the world. 12, here's the original. The original Diplodocus fossil skeleton reconstructed, still on magnificent display, the showcase display. You even have your little mural back here, your painting and your ferns and whatnot to give you some context of uh, make you transport you back in time. All right, here's the original. Here is your plaster cast, okay? Um, this was considered such a spectacular one of the more complete finds that had ever been found before, that Carnegie decided to make plaster cast of it, 12 plaster casts like you're seeing here, sometimes posed in different positions and scientists would criticize how it's being posed, um, as gifts to major institutions throughout the world. In fact, the, the Carnegie Diplodocus was so well known and so closely associated with his financing, with his lobbying, uh, with his actual name, that it gets named after him. I've been referring to it by this name, but obviously before it was named like this, it didn't have this name. Uh, once he promotes it and it's so closely associated with him, they decide to name it Diplodocus Carnegie. Vertebrate paleontologists officially name it uh, Diplodocus Carnegie. One of Carnegie's scientists on his payroll even told him, quote, now the biggest thing on earth of its kind bears your name. So you are sure of immortality in the annals of science, right? Pony up the dough for scientific work, whether it's natural history or whether it's human history. Um, and you can launder your money into social and political respectability, even get your name. This is the equivalent of having your name uh, on the Freer Gallery, the Sackler Gallery. Um, now you have your name on the actual scientific name of an ancient dinosaur that's associated with you. All right. Now, this particular dinosaur, the Carnegie, the, the, the Plotticus Carnegie, was found in Wyoming in 1898, and it attracted enormous press attention. And this enormous press attention, in turn, attracted Carnegie, who entered a bidding war with the University of Wyoming to acquire it. Here's some of the press attention that you see. Uh, we talked about sort of the sensational nature of it, playing up the colossal monstrous size of it. You have it once more. I love this in the in the uh, uh, mi 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 middle of this. Uh, press report, you've got the Diplodocus uh, uh, apparently climbing up 
Uh, this is like the video game Rampage, where you have King Kong and a lizard and Godzilla all going up and down build buildings and whatnot. Uh, you see they're trying to compare it as high as the highest skyscrapers uh, on Earth at that time period. Obviously, it wouldn't be uh, uh, able to climb or it wouldn't be as impressive an illustration if we were talking about skyscrapers at the height that they are today. Uh, but you can see how it's constantly exaggerating the size, showing that just, what is this, the femur bone or a thigh bone, uh, as tall as a human being, uh, just the bone alone. Uh, the brontosaurus in this article, the print is very, very small, uh, but it says that the brontosaurus uh, there, or diplodocus, it was called a brontosaurus first, later diplodocus, was so big that, quote, one man cannot lift its smallest bone, and that these creatures were so gigantic that they would make a modern elephant look like a mouse, ensuring that even before man appeared on the earth, the United States of North America must have enjoyed a reputation for big things like it possesses now. Here's your first example in which we are seeing modern day national identities infused into things that are 100 million years old. One paper in Britain during, a 19, during the 1905 exhibit when you had that plaster cast sent to London and given as a gift by Carnegie, uh, said that, quote, even in the earliest periods, our American cousins did things on a more colossal scale. Right? Somehow, uh, these dinosaurs are representative of the, of the modern United States nation. Now, note how they've been very selective here. It's just the white Anglo-Saxon wasp nation that these ancient dinosaurs are imagined to represent. Uh, no one is saying that these represent the Native American indigenous peoples of North America, which by this logic would make just as much sense uh, to uh, say that they are the embodiment. They're the ones who are on this land for 14,000 years. How come these dinosaurs are not an embodiment of them? Well, because that doesn't fit your ideological agenda. So obviously it's only the embodiment of the people that it's useful to their agenda to be the embodiment of. So with all this press attention uh, and the realization that these bones are going to be interpreted in political terms as somehow an emblem of Americans, um, we see that uh, he decided he got this idea, I'm going to make casts. I'm going to be a wonderful international global philanthropist. We're going to make plaster casts, 12 of them, and donate them around the world. He got this idea after King Edward VII, the British King Edward VII, visited Pittsburgh, visited his museum in 1902. The king saw a framed lithograph of the Diplodocus skeleton on the wall and asked, could I get one of these monsters for Britain? Uh, here we have, uh, there it is, the Carnegie Diplodocus cast uh, on, on display in London. Uh, the king actually said, any, any chance that we could get this? Um, and so Carnegie, and here you see in a contemporary cartoon, a little bit blurry there, uh, but you can still read it. Uh, the British Empire, the king, uh, Carnegie, and his Diplodocus. Diplodocus, compliments of A. Carnegie. All right, Carnegie uh, proudly replied to the king that, quote, this namesake of mine just so happened to be the hugest quadruped that ever walked the earth. So Carnegie sees an opportunity to garner social and political capital by reversing the flow of prestige goods between the old world and the new world for the first time. We have something the Europeans want, not the other way around. That's not easy to do. Usually we, we covet old world European prestige goods. Uh, now they want something that only we Americans have. Now, unfortunately, for Carnegie, the British press didn't always echo the positive association of American dinosaurs with American power and prestige, burgeoning American nation. <laughs> what am I showing this for? Uh, I went too far. Sorry. One British newspaper pointed out that Diplodocus, quote, was a great digesting machine whose brain cavity was no bigger than a walnut. Another said that it was an aimless, stupid sort of reptile with an enormous mouth that even in the bone is suggestive of an expansive and inane smile. A third British journalist said that while Mr. Carnegie no doubt means well, and his intentions are undoubtedly benevolent, I would prefer that the Diplodocus to be returned to America as, quote, America is the proper sphere for such unreasonably developed monsters. So you can see here, this is sort of just the inverse mirror image 
of uh, the same association of ancient dinosaur bones with the modern nation. Just one has a positive spin and one has a negative spin. The positive spin is that the, 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 uh, uh, this Diplodocus is somehow emblematic of growing American might and power in the American nation, but only the very specific American nation that they want to actually have it be the embodiment of. And the other one says, yes, it is the embodiment of your nation. But it's sort of a stupid, you know, inane animal. Uh, it's a, it's sort of, uh, you know, overly monstrous, an unreasonably developed monster, ungainly, like a teenager growing up um, and not yet an adult. And sort of, you know, reversing the criticism. What's important for our point here, though, is that both sides of the interpretation, whether positive or negative, go off the exact same assumption that this is an embodiment of America modern day American identity. They just choose to put a slightly different spin on it depending on what their own ideological agenda was. Another approach of criticism from the British side was to remind everyone that Diplodocus was just a more developed form of the same dinosaurs that were first found in England in 1820. And don't you forget it, uh, they may have found more spectacular, larger beasts, uh, unreasonably developed monsters out in the American West. But let's not remember. Dinosaurs started in English, in England. We're the ones who found them. They said that, and uh, uh, one journalist said that, quote, this Diplodocus was merely an improved and enlarged form of an English creature. What immediately comes to mind is uh, some of the uh, mid, and, mid to late 19th century uh, uh, North American interpretations of Mayan civilization in Mesoamerica, in which they were very annoyed that the most spectacular monumental ruins in all the Americas were not within the boundaries of the United States. Uh, they wanted them to be within the boundaries of the United States so they could say that we're sort of the successors of this great civilization and North America is the proper place for this. So some North American scholars actually started to peddle the, the idea, the theory, that uh, Mesoamerican civilization was first planted, was first developed in North America with sort of these you know, mounds and some evidence of uh, urban civilization in North America among, among the Native Americans. And it began here, and then they just migrated south and then reached its fullest flowering in Mesoamerica but we still get to claim it. The Mexicans don't get to claim it. We get to claim it uh, because it fits our ideological and political agenda for this to be an emblem of us, not you. That's the same thing that the British criticism is doing with the Diplodocus Carnegie. The humorless Germans were even less forgiving, uh, claiming that the American reconstruction and pose of Diplodocus was all wrong. They said it should look like an alligator waddling, not an elephant plotting. To them, the Diplodocus plaster reconstruction represented the height of American ostentation and vulgarity. And they said it's not even the original bones. This is a plaster cast. It's fake from beginning to end. Nevertheless, Carnegie's Diplodocus went on display at the Berlin Museum of Natural History. Uh, so the Germans responded. Um, the Germans responded by finding an even larger Brachiosaurus in Tanzania, the German colony of Tanzania in Central East Africa. I found this in 1909, and it was excavated between 1909 to 1903. And they said, this is much larger than the Carnegie Diplodocus. Uh, we have a Brachiosaurus that towers over it. So what should we do with this? How should we display it? Should we put it in its own separate room? You know, this will be one dinosaur, this will be another, and, you know, people can compare them separately. No. They said, we're going to build it right next to the Carnegie Diplodocus, and we're going to show how it towers over it. And note here the explicit contrast. All right, the Carnegie Diplodocus, even they have the neck and the head sort of straight and going down. What did they do with the Brachiosaurus? They could have had this, they could have had this head down and sort of in the same position like this. No, they said, we're going to raise it up. That's going to go up. It's going to really illustrate the full height. It's already a bigger beast, all right? Uh, but they really wanted to accentuate the difference <laughs> uh, right next to the Carnegie Diplodocus. So everyone knew the Germans have found uh, the largest one ever. This is still the largest mounted dinosaur skeleton anywhere in the world. And it has towered over Carnegie's Diplodocus ever since the Germans put it up right next to it in the early decades of the 20th century. As a result, the American paleontologist Charles Schuchert at the time, after seeing what the Germans had done, admitted that though the Americans were, quote, long proud in the belief that America had reared the largest of all animals, 
that honor may now go to Germany. <laughs> you can see how ridiculous this is. This is dino nationalism in its crudest and most laughable form. Right, the Brachiosaurus somehow is emblematic of German nationalism. Uh, it's utterly absurd. Now, the only thing that you could really say would make any sense is if you said the ability to curate and reconstruct this dinosaur, that is somehow emblematic of modern German ingenuity, economics, you know, power. All right, you can make a plausible claim to that, perhaps. Okay, but to suggest that this is somehow uh, speaks to the character of the German nation, the American nation. I mean, this stuff is utterly absurd. And Germany didn't even rear this uh, Brachiosaurus, all right? It's not theirs. They found it in Tanzania. That's Africa. <laughs> if it's an emblem of anyone, why wouldn't it be an emblem of Africans living in Tanzania? Right, uh, just like the selectiveness with saying that the American West dinosaurs are emblematic of the Anglo-Saxon white part of the nation, but not uh, the African Americans, not the Native Americans, or any of the other minorities from southern and east, uh, southern Europe at the time period, who also would have been discriminated against at that time period. Now. There are new interpretations of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are perennially fascinating. Everyone's always interested in dinosaurs. And today, sort of as a coda to the story, I'm almost done here. I told you this would be a fairly quick one today. Um, we are seeing that there are new interpretations of dinosaurs. And yes, there's science there. There's always science there. I'm not trying to discount that we aren't learning things and that real scientific work isn't happening. Absolutely it is. But there's always a political spin that is put on this. Maybe not even from the scientists themselves. Some scientists would prefer to be apolitical and say, come on, I just want to do my data, do my research, and reconstruct this to the best of my ability and understand the light ways of life of this dinosaur. Okay? But scholars are luxuries in this world. I am a luxury. A professor of history, I am an enormous luxury that can only exist in a society with a massive surplus of wealth that can afford to support me. All I do is look at history, read about history, do research in archives, and then teach about it. You could totally get rid of me, and life would go on. Same with these scholars who study dinosaurs. Right? We are luxuries. And so, yes, we do, I hope we do, great research work, scholarly work, whether it's natural history or human history. Um, but the people who are paying for us to exist, they want something for their money. And people don't give away money without getting something in return. That's one of the cardinal rules of the world. <laughs> it's always been like that, always will be. Okay, and what are the people who are actually paying for the museum, paying for the salaries of a history professor, of a paleontologist? Someone's paying a lot of money. What are they getting in return? Political emblems, uh, laundering of their money in abstract benevolent institutions like museums. Um, and that's again what we're seeing today. But it might surprise you that it's not the Germans or the Americans or the British who are sort of at the forefront of new ideological interpretations of dinosaurs. Uh, it's the Chinese. Right? Previously, it was Europeans and Americans, you know, eventually the Americans, leading the pack and saying, we are at the forefront of interpreting dinosaurs, reconstructing them, and also using dinosaur reconstructions to advertise our political and economic might. Now, today, all the most exciting finds are in China usually northeastern China or southeastern China. And Chinese scientists are the leading vertebrate paleontologists in the world today who work in what for them is their new equivalent of the 19th century American West. Okay, uh, side note, Roy Chapman Andrews, when he's going into China in the 1920s, he's gonna encounter the opposition of the Chinese scholars who will say all, chi all dinosaur bones, all, all um, sorry, uh, yeah, dinosaur eggs, anything you find from the prehistorical age in China is an emblem of the Chinese nation, belongs to us. You can't take this away. When they find the bones of the famous hominid uh, Peking man in the 1920s, even though it's 500,000 years old. Peking man is an emblem of the modern Chinese nation. Sorry, <laughs> it stays here. Okay, uh, so today you're you know, seeing the extension of this legacy into the 21st century. With China's burgeoning wealth and power, they're creating their own showcase magnificent museums with top scholars throughout the world. New dinosaur exhibits and museums are popping up in all every single major Chinese city. Newly wealthy Chinese industrialists 
are seeking out the patronage of this of, of these exhibits for, to create their own social and political capital, to do their own money laundering. The largest collection of dinosaur bones, reconstructed dinosaurs anywhere in the world now is here. The Shandong Tianyu Museum of Nature, which was financed by a gold miner by the name of Zheng Xiaoting. And it's these finds in northeastern China that are at the forefront of new theories. Well, not really new. I mean, they've been around for 20, 30 years now. Jurassic Park in the 19, uh, 1993 was also a, a big one that sort of first promoted these theories in the mainstream press and whatnot. Uh, but the idea that dinosaurs may have been feathered. That they are actually, they didn't really go totally extinct in a massive cataclysmic event, but they evolved into birds. Uh, you know, this is an idea that has gained more strength um, on findings of new fossil remains that have been preserved in, in wonderful ways in northeastern China, where actual feathers have been preserved. To really sort of give, you know, substantiate this idea. Whoa, maybe this is true. All this is happening in China. And you think it's apolitical? You think the Chinese are neutral about this? Hell no. They themselves also are very proud of this and say somehow this is an emblem of Chinese ingenuity, the spirit of the Chinese nation. We're at the forefront of this. It's an emblem of our wealth, power, our scholarly expertise. And somehow the realization that the dinosaurs may have been feathered birds in some sense uh, is a reflection of modern China. I love this picture. This is another one of these major museums in Liaoning. This is also in the northeastern part of China, the Beipiao Pterosaur Museum. Here you have the director of the museum, a man by the name of Liu Tsunyu, standing in front of one of his reconstructions in his museum. This guy is, you know, filthy rich. You know, he's laundering his money <laughs> once more in a natural history museum. You know what he named this dinosaur? Moganopterus Jueana. Moganopterus Jueana. You know what Jueana is? <laughs> the name of his wife, Dwayana. His dinosaur displayed in his museum is scientifically named after his wife. Okay, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? This is your exact equivalent to Diplodocus Carnegie from the early 20th century as an emblem of American might, American ingenuity, the American nation flexing its political might and muscle and dinosaurs were an embodiment of that. Here you have the exact same thing. Wealthy Chinese industrialist in a rising burgeoning China using dinosaurs as a symbol of their wealth and power and ability to name things. And what do they name it after? Very personal things. His own wife, uh, a, a dinosaur is now named after him. Uh, the idea that, uh, you know, the sort of pioneering theory of uh, feathered dinosaurs, long sort of seen as a crackpot fringe theory, uh, now being substantiated and put into the mainstream of dinosaur research by what dinosaur fossils? Fossils found in China, all right? Take great pride in this. So you can see, Nothing from the past is going to be immune to modern nationalism, to the modern politicization of these things. Um, and I always point out the absurdity of this when we're talking about historical objects. Our historical objects, we talk about the perception of cultural continuity, the perception of cultural discontinuity, and how there are many ruptures throughout history. And it's not a one-to-one -one correlation of this is from that society, oh, now I understand what that society is like, and it's my society, my ancestors. I point out the absurdity of that all the time for historical artifacts. How much more absurd is it when it's prehistorical artifacts? But that's exactly what it is. And it just goes to show how strong and impregnable the allure is for people to want to squeeze social and political capital out of anything from the past. There's no such thing as completely scientifically disin uh, politically disinterested scientific research. Wonderful research does occur, but there will always be a political spin on that research by the people who actually pay for that research to be done. All right, we're all done today. Uh, I hope next time you go into a dinosaur exhibit somewhere, you might have some of these ideas on your mind uh, to help you more critically assess what you are uh, seeing before you. All right, take care.